himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here we go on the wild, wild west. On the big high spring, the tide must come almost up to the wheel. Sorry. On the big high spring, the tide must come yeah, almost up to the wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see it there. <laughs> <laughs> Do the old run down the trailer. Yeah. 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 Have the tyres going down. <laughs> yeah. There's a Bronco Brothers. It makes me laugh every time I see yeah. it. You could put a nylon that. <laughs> yeah, and it is, right, it, is. it is nylon as well. Look. Yeah, no. yeah, that's huge. Welcome back to the second attempt to find this World War II Hawker Hurricane plane which crashed into the sea in 1944. Our first attempt ended up coming up with no plane, unfortunately. So we're heading out for a second attempt to see if we can find this plane very brief summary of the story of this plane it was a pilot called Robert Sterling ditched into the sea after running short on fuel after mistaking the glare of a greenhouse as Guernsey for the White Cliffs of Dover. This great little interesting story from World War II has been captured by Tim Osborne and made into a film with Gaz Patworth from Element Films. As we done our gear getting ready to go back into the depths to have a look, we remember the story you heard from Ray Tostadin. He see seen it on the edge of the sand when he was from Aspen Snorkeling. Very weedy. Yeah, it's that. Uh, that dog showing up, you know. We really want to go. 
south first two pitch, head south until right, we turn and, and just keep sending in the easterly grove. We go in, if we go in and go west for like 20 feet hits and then we'll go south. Just so we're a little bit further over that way. Want me to drop you over there? Yeah, that'd be oh, nice. you can do that. Yeah. yeah. The pilot, Robert Sterling, had to ditch in the sea off of Leo. We can see Leo on our right and Guernsey on our left. Yeah, good luck, chaps. Yeah, thank you. You can pass around your wrist later. Yeah, just grab it. Okay. Yeah. As soon as you jump into the water, you realise the magnitude of looking for this plane. It's a larger area, and look at the weed. The good thing is, we're only in four and a half metres of water here, and we're not expected to go much deeper than ten metres. Take a look at this seaweed, leaning in the direction of the tides running. Check out the iridescent on the seaweed. It's iridescent because it's actually better for it in the sunlight. It loses the iridescence when it gets washed up and it's out of the sea. This place is heaving with seaweed, from bone mason's hookweed to Irish moss, beautiful eyelash weed, dulse, Purple laver, rainbow weed, mermaid's treesis, golden kelp, sugar kelp, bushy rainbow rack, brown forking, fur bellows, and fong weed, and also pod weed. It's got it all. Some of this seaweed's native, but some of it's invasive that's been brought over, no doubt in ship's ballast. I think now we're getting somewhere, because we've come off the reef and now we're, well, sort of on sand. Still wouldn't say it's on the edge of a reef looking over though, onto sand, as Ray explained in his story. Still worth checking every single mound. Everything that stands more than maybe two foot of seabed. Yeah, there's a lot of things to look at. This is a mermaid's purse. These are them black things you find at the top of the beach. Normally washed up right along the high tide mark with the seaweed. Phil points out a humongous orma just sitting in this crevice. It almost looks like it's carved the hole out for it to sit in. Almost a perfect shape for it.
Although these things are pretty cool to see and film, we're not here to survey Ormers, so let's get back to looking for the plane. With every reef we come over now, they're almost like fingers. We can then see more and more sand. So, I've got a good feeling we're heading in the right direction. Here's another mermaid's purse. This one, you can actually see the baby shark inside. You can see it moving around, wriggling ever so slightly. I'll leave it be. As to be expected on this rocky ground, there's hundreds of ballinrass, rockfish, gold sinnies, and also this very battered jellyfish. Looks like the fish have been feeding on it. As we come over this ridge of rock, I notice it comes onto an even better sandy area. This is what we're kind of looking for. As I lift my head and look at this shape, this is exactly the same sort of shape I was expecting in my mind for the airplane to look like now. Is this an engine? No, it's just another rock. In terms of uh, white sand, it is the area, but it's still needle in a haystack because there's just so much kelp. There's a seaweed down there. Yeah, loads of kelp, but this is the only bit I've noticed out of all of this. It's got uh, sand. There's like little figures of reef that come out and then white sand. So, yeah. potentially. As I get back down to the seabed, I'm thinking to myself, any one of these lumps could be the plane. And I wouldn't even know. We haven't got time to check every single lump. This really is a mammoth task. Now I'm starting to see things. Is that a propeller over there in the distance? Hmm, no, just a bit of seaweed. Everything I look at now looks an odd shape. Either looks cylindrical or square or rectangular. Uh. 
Whilst I'm out on the sand, Phil and Jen scrape all the way along the edge of the reef, just sticking to it, checking. Yeah, I'm really starting to look at everything and think it's a plane now. Could this be the plane? It was made out of wood and canvas, so the fuselage and wings are probably rotted away by now. Maybe just the engine, maybe cockpit, bits and pieces. He's a baby or Michelle. Long dead. Look at the pedestrians on it. I keep getting sidetracked, I need to carry on looking for this plane. Although it's really hard to tell, I've now actually double backed on myself and we're heading up the other side of the reef, back to where we started. After well over an hour of searching for this plane, it looks like we can't find it. Have we swum past it? Possibly. Or will we swim past it in the last two, three minutes? As we're nearing the ends of our tank, we decide it's best to go up. This is a great time for Jen to practice her delayed SMB. This is a critical task you need to be able to do as a diver. Although the DSMB is getting inflated, we feel slightly deflated after not finding this plane. This would have closed the story on Tim's project, would have made a really good ending. But anyway, it wasn't to be this time round. Now the weather's closed in for the year and we won't get a chance to come back. Maybe next year. No aircraft. No. See you at area, that's that second guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm scoping it out. I'm only looking for an aeroplane. I'm not after your lobsters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, enjoyable, guys. Shame. Well, Tim, okay. we have tried. I know you have tried. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, all credit to you. Uh, It's just that it could be under the sand. Yeah, oh, we, oh, I might have swung past it. It might have been looking left while I was swimming and then it was on the right, but... But it is a, well, a needle in a haystack. It just gives them a week. Yeah. But I did have a really good feeling when we hit that big sandy area. Yeah. 
Did you cover most of that sandy area? Was there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a large, uh, I suppose it was like an oval area. Right. We swam up the side of it. I was in the middle, pretty much in the middle. Swam around it, down the other side. Then we shunted across onto the reef and we came back to it again. We had a big right. enough span amongst all of us to yeah. go. Right. right. It's a shame.